Topping the news at 7. Discussions being held for a six-month extension of moratorium on bank loans. Major update from Tourism Minister on the recovery of the sector and the impact of COVID-19. Bench warrant against St. Peter MP Asset Michael discharged after his apology to the court on Thursday. And a flurry of activity at the airport as several stakeholders converge for a major simulation exercise. The details of the ABS Evening News right now. The local evening news is brought to you by Nagico, local agents, Bryson's Insurance. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for the evening news here on ABS, Antigua's News Authority. My name is Garfield Burford. And I'm Charmaine Jeremy, and a pleasant good evening to all our viewers, especially those joining us on Facebook online. And News Now, people servicing loans with the commercial banks will be keenly interested in. Discussions took place in Cabinet yesterday with the president of the country's Bankers Association, which are likely to result in a six-month extension of the moratorium on loan repayments. That's right, Charmaine. Now, the current arrangement had been put in place as a result of the fallout caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. ABS's uh, Rakib Aparisu has the very latest from this morning's post-cabinet media briefing. They had uh, expressed a desire to take the remaining uh, week and then some that remains on the current moratorium to fine-tune uh, the, the modalities for the further extension of the moratorium. When Antigua and Barbuda first went into lockdown back in March, an agreement was arrived at with commercial banks for moratorium on mortgage debt repayments. The moratoria, which were applied on a case-by-case -case basis and originally set to last for a six-month period, would have come to an end this month. Given that uh, persons are out of a job at the moment, rather than going to foreclosure, uh, this is a better option to allow them some space to, to recover, as it were. And I think that they're looking at another period of six months. So this will take us into the new year. During this time, the requirement for repayment will be deferred until the expiration of the moratorium. Meanwhile, the government will be providing up to $50 million for the establishment of partial credit guarantees. If a business should fall into default, then the obligation would be to the government to be able to, to meet that expectation. So the banks are going to be assured that they're not going to be leave, left holding the, holding the bag as it were. Rakib Aparicio reporting for ABS News. Also coming out of cabinet this morning, the post-cabinet media briefing, students who returned to the classroom earlier this week will very soon have access to free internet hotspots as schools use a blended learning approach. The idea is to have these hotspots in centralized areas in the community where there's easy access. Um, and safe access for, for, for young people. Mr. Nicholas says the initiative will supplement measures already implemented by the government in collaboration with network providers to assist students. While a number of details are yet to be ironed out, Minister Nicholas provides clarity on the reasoning behind the location of the hotspots. He says they will be placed based on discussions with the Ministry of Information Technology, that, as well as INET, the Minister of Education, and the Member of Parliament representing the constituency. Wherever there are gaps and they can be identified, we will uh, evaluate and, and provide the resources in those particular areas. Minister Nicholas also says the service will not be extended to Bar sorry will be extended uh, to Bar well actually will not be extended to Barbuda in the, at least in the first instance. This he says is due to a significant drop in internet capacity on the sister isle. They're only at 50 megabits per second. Uh, many of the other secondary schools have at least uh, one uh, one gig of capacity into each of these schools. So we are going to ensure that Barbuda gets up to that speed, but it is limited by the amount of capacity that exists, currently exists between both islands. A new development this evening, uh, because we have a progress report on the country's most important revenue earning sector, tourism, buffeted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The global industry is expected to lose hundreds of billions of dollars this year amid travel restrictions. Stakeholders are now eager to see a rebound in tourism across the globe, Jermaine. And Barbuda was the first country within the Caribbean to reopen its borders following the lockdown in March due to the spread of the coronavirus. The country has been seeing signs of a recovery with some hotels having reopened with strict safety protocols and more expected to reopen as the winter tourism season approaches. 
All right, so joining us this evening with an update now is Minister for Tourism and Investment, Honorable Charles Fernandez. Very good evening to you, Minister, joining us on Skype. Really appreciate your company. Uh, early days yet, obviously, but how much has the sector recovered so far? Okay, thank you. Good evening uh, to both of you. Yes. Um, I, I have the figures for you up to the end of July, and uh, it's very good. Uh, for example, you know, we shut down around the middle of March. We did, uh, we had 16,459 visitors in March. That's from about 30,000 in March 2019. April, we had uh, probably five, and that was probably uh, people coming back from the U.S. who may have uh, properties at Jumbi Bay, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, that's April, 5, May, 11. June, we reopened, as you know. We had 2,677 tourists visiting. And uh, in July, we went up to 4,002. So the good news is that we be, be expecting to see this uh, increase, more flights increase uh, going forward. For example, I can tell you, in September, Air Canada starts one flight a week. In October, we had Virgin, three types a week, Sunwing, two flights a week, and United Airlines, one flight a week. So we expect to see it increase going forward. Um, it, 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 other news to report in terms of the industry is not just air alone. The boat show is on for December 4th to 9th, 2020. That is important for us. And of course, sailing week 2021, you would have heard is uh, scheduled to, as a matter of fact, the number of boats that are already, a uh, number of people registering their boats already. In terms of hotel properties, we presently have 14 properties open, 874 rooms, 28% of our room stock. October, November, we expect another 16 hotels to reopen, adding another 1,497 rooms or an additional 48% of our room stock. And of course, the there are five hotels that we're still not 100% sure as to opening dates. That represents 24% of our room stock. Cruise industry is still very much uncertain. We expect to have a few ships in before the end of the year, but uh, nothing significant going until going into, I think, uh, March, February, March, April next year. Thank you, Minister. Charmaine here. Do you have any idea how many persons have returned to their jobs in the hospitality sector? I don't have the exact figure, if I'm not mistaken. The last figure I had was just around uh, just under 2,000. Um, so you can extrapolate it out from there. The thing, too, is some hotels have opened and have not brought back the full complement uh, for two reasons. One is the whole aspect of social distancing, and the other part of it is because they're not up to full capacity. I actually today visited, we visited uh, uh, Coco Bay, and uh, incidentally, that is run by an Antiguan. It's an Antiguan manager. And they have 90% occupancy at this point in time. So that is, that is positive for us, and we're very happy. There's 140 people employed at that property. The other thing that we have done is we have increased our vigilance throughout the hotel properties that are open to ensure that the staff especially, and of course the guests, are following the protocols, the face masks, uh, to ensure that everything that is related to the whole aspect of the protocols are uh, being uh, adhered to. Even our vendors, we are monitoring them and checking on them. Yes, I, I think it's a good segue because it uh, impacts on the question I was going to ask you next, Minister, in terms of how the visitors have been responding to the new normal. We should tell our viewers as well that they would have noticed a little bit of a distortion on your, on your line based on your connection, but uh, we're still able to hear you. So how have the visitors been reacting to this new normal? I, just from my experience today and from me uh, getting feedback, uh, we believe that the, the tourists are actually, or the visitors, are uh, very impressed, one, with the protocols that are put in place, how efficient and careful we are with how we handle the airport. Uh, the Port Health is doing a very, very good job uh, from what we are, the feedback we are getting. And uh, um, we, we just need to ensure now on our side of it that uh, there are no slip-ups in terms of the hotel properties, the employees at the hotel, and, of course, the guests. So 
we are really monitoring this in a very serious way. We are, Public Works has given us an additional vehicle to add to our fleet in terms of monitoring, and we continue to train our people, to add people that are, would normally be doing other jobs. We've now shifted them. So we have everybody just about working full-time now within the ministry. All right, let's final question, and very quickly, Minister, in terms of what's the next big thing on the horizon for the sector for tourism? Well, you know, we're just uh, about completing the cruise port, I think, uh, the pier. I think that is uh, going to be very, very exciting news. We're now moving to see how quickly we can do the actual uh, dredging of the entrance. But the pier is almost completed. I think that is a great thing. I think the fact that we were able to tie this down with global ports holding is has been really, really important for us. It has clearly uh, allowed us to take the lead within the region in terms of our cruise port facilities. Thank you so much, Minister, for your time tonight. We're all very optimistic uh, about our tourism industry bouncing back. And I know staycation campaign was quite a success, so we're just keeping our fingers crossed and continuing to, to work hard towards you know, keeping Antigua and Barbuda and its industry afloat. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Minister. I think the connection just went a little while ago. And of course, it's an issue and an area, Charmaine, that you know far more about than uh, many of us. <laughs> All right, let's go on to another story now. The bench warrant that was issued for Member of Parliament for St. Peter, the Honorable Asset Michael, has been discharged. Chief Magistrate Joanne Walsh issued the warrant <laughs> Wednesday after the MP failed to appear in court for a civil matter. When, Mr. when MP Michael appeared in court this morning with his attorneys, he received a warning from the magistrate after apologizing for missing his court date. In a media release, the St. Peter MP says there was absolutely no intention on his part of, for dis, of disrespecting the court and that he was only absent because of illness. He says, quote, as a long-standing member of parliament who always abides by the decisions of our courts and who never expects or requests any special treatment from our courts or judiciary, I know better, end quote. The MP says he was sick at home with low blood pressure and chest pains since last week Wednesday when he was taken to the Mount St. John's Medical Center in a public ambulance. MP Michael says he visited an ophthalmologist, Dr. Ian Walwyn, at his office last Friday for a blood vessel that burst in his left eye. The MP also reveals he is on heavy sedation medication and says given the suffering and inconvenience of his circumstances, he was unable to attend court. MP Michael explains, with due respect for the court and in the interest of not causing any delay in the delivery of justice, he did not ask for an adjournment of the matter and instructed his attorneys to advise the court that he wished for a continuation of the hearing in his absence. The MP is being sued for not paying for work done for him in his private capacity, allegedly, a claim he calls outrageous. The case is scheduled to resume on the 21st of September. And in other news, the Immigration Department has issued a wanted bulletin for Delmar Johnson. The 34-year-old Jamaican is dark in complexion, about 5 foot 7, and slimly built at 150 pounds. Johnson is wanted for escaping custody. Anyone with information on the whereabouts of Johnson is asked to contact the Immigration Enforcement Unit at 464-3245 or 464-3141 or the nearest police station. The public is discouraged from harboring or approaching the man. Well, the next sitting of the Liquor License Court for the hearing of applications for new licenses and renewal of existing licenses will be the 1st of October this year. That announcement this evening from Chief Magistrate Joan Walsh, who says it will be convened at 10 a.m. at the Magistrate's Court in Gray's Farm, as we said on the 1st of October. Applications alongside proof of advertisement should be sent to the Chief Magistrate and the Commissioner of Police no less than two weeks before the sitting date. It remains illegal for any person, business, establishment, or club to deal in any manner in intoxicating liquors without the appropriate licenses. We're covering Antigua and Barbuda and the world. Stay with us for more of those stories that we're tracking for you this evening here regionally and internationally, including this one. A buzz of activity at the airport today. But no need for alarm. It was a simulation exercise. Plus, later on, should the police share more information about ongoing investigations? The police commissioner responds as he speaks with ABS. Stay with us. All these stories and more coming up ahead. At Najiko, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like your boat when you're at sea and you get away from everything. Your home and the security of your daughter's things. 
and the car that you've had for too long. But after all these years, you just can't let go. At Magico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. This year, back to school will look a lot different, but no matter the situation, students still need their supplies. Child's Toys Gifts and Housewares has all your needs in our spacious and well-laid-out back-to-school center, situated at the back in the toy department. Top quality paper and correct ruling composition books in hard and flex cover. Saved by the pack, along with penmanship, square line, and exercise books. Gear up and stock up with all your school tools, such as pens and pencils, in various colors and grades, art and craft supplies, geometry sets, calculators, geometric sets, flash drives and SD cards. Tough and durable school and lunch bags, water bottles and food containers are all here, along with clothing accessories such as PE shirts in various colors and sizes. Also available are face masks and face shields, even for the little ones. So shop safely and with ease at our one-stop back-to-school center at Charles Toys Gifts and Housewares and Tiga's Family Store. Hot topics, polarizing debates, Monday Night Live with Ursula Charles Jr., 8.30 p.m. We're taking the show on the road. Our full-service mobile store will be at an area near you each week, Mondays to Saturdays. Stop by to top up, pay a bill, make a purchase, or activate a new service. Like our Flow Facebook page or follow us at Flow Antigua on Instagram to get updates on our weekly mobile store schedule. Flow, keeping you connected and closer than ever. And welcome back to the ABS Evening News. And flights scheduled to land at the BC Bird International Airport this morning had to divert as the facility was closed for a major simulation exercise. ABS's Jessica Russell observed the flurry of activity. Emergency responders flocked to this area in a simulation exercise where a 737 plane crashed. The fire department arrived a minute after hearing of the simulated accident in the Shell Beach area where a bus was used as a substitute for an aircraft. The flames were extinguished and rescue operations began to remove the 151 passengers from the site. The injured were taken away in ambulances. The exercise was also complete with media updates. Inspector Lester Baggett was the information officer on the scene. At present, rescue operations have been concluded. Airport Head of Safety and Security Avery Henry says the drill will help to improve the airport's international standing. According to the International Civil Aviation, every, every, every country, every state should do full-scale exercise every two years and in between, a type of tabletop in between in, in the sub subsequent year. So we are in violation of that, so now we have been, we will be clearing our deficiencies or non-compliance as far as international civilization is concerned. The National Office of Disaster Services facilitated the training. Director Fillmore Mullins says he'd rate the execution of the emergency response at a 6 out of 10. A lot of things did not happen as quickly as they could have, and that is because the information did not get to the responding agencies and time because of the communication challenges. Mullins says recommendations will be made to improve on weak areas. Jessica Russell, ABS News. Thanks, Jessica. Now, Police Commissioner Atlee Rodney is defending the approach regarding sharing information with the public on certain investigations. His comments come amid a clamor in some segments of the society for more information from the police. Some of the, the, the demands are unreasonable because, for instance, I, I will continue to say you cannot investigate a case in public and you cannot try a case in public. And there are some sectors of the community who have that unreasonable expectation that I can come and tell you, okay, this morning I'm going to do this, or this morning I'm going to do this, I'm going in an investigation. That is not likely. And the police chief says by working mainly away from the spotlight, the rigor of an inquiry is being protected. The perpetrators also listen to interviews. You know, the suspects are listening to see what's the next move. And if they can get it from state media, well, thank you very much. <laughs> you understand? So we have to be um, sensitive to some of the matters that we're dealing with and how much information we can put in the public. He was a guest on Antigua Barbuda today with Ursula Charles Jr. 
The sweet potato weevil is the bane of many farmers in this country, wreaking havoc on their crops. The Ministry of Agriculture is moving to ensure all farmers know about an innovative natural control of the pest. It involves using pheromones or chemicals naturally secreted by the female weevil. Kim Emanuel Baird explains. The sweet potato weevil is not new to Antigua and Barbuda, but the Agriculture Ministry is intensifying its response. We are of the view that coming early next year um, with, the, with the work of the ICA you know, um, Institute that we've been doing a lot of work. Alabanjo says the ministry is making it a priority to train farmers on how to handle this problem. We intend to re-educate, to inform and train our farmers as to how we can use the pheromone. Pheromone is not a chemical product. Pheromone is just it's a scent of, um, how will I explain it very simple, it's just like a scent of the female, female insect. This is crucial to boost local production and thereby eliminate the need to return to imports of sweet potatoes. Alobandra explains that it starts with the farming practices, which can reduce the effects of the weevil. When I say cultural practices, you are even talking of your land preparation. You understand me? And I've said to you, farmers are in the habit too, of using certain chemical, you know, to stop the effect of this you know, attack from this potato weevil. He says using soil management and this pheromone without the harsh chemicals can help alleviate the problem. Kim Emanuel Baird reporting for ABS News. Thanks, Kim, and we certainly follow that very closely. Now, women are at the helm of all major technical, vocational, education, and training, or TVET, programs in Antigua and Barbuda. It's a development welcomed by acting head of campus at the Antigua and Barbuda International Institute of Technology, ABIT, Dr. Daniel Martin. It shows that we live in a diverse community where opportunities are available to both men and women. So it's very good to know that in Antigua and Barbuda we have women that have stepped up into leadership roles and continue to pursue leadership roles across academia and in, and in industry. Dr. Daniel Martin says she believes the rise has been fostered by society's urging. I've never felt like as a female that we were placed in any way that we could not step into leadership roles so I think it's a good thing. I think we set the trend for the upcoming generation that both male and females, you have the opportunity to pursue whatever dream, academic or professional, that you would like to pursue. Well, if you never noticed, women are currently leading operations at the Guard Center, the ABHTI, as well as ABIT, the National Training Agency, and ABIS. Meanwhile, plans are afoot to certify current inmates at Her Majesty's Prison in technical and vocational areas. That's the update from Acting Chief Executive Officer of the Antigua and Barbuda National Training Agency, Casey Maxwell-Roberts. The persons in there are actually doing various uh, skilled programs and they're saying, listen, we want them to, to leave better than they came in. So therefore now they're looking at training them in the skilled areas, plumbing, especially that they go out to do this where they build the homes. Yes. So they're looking at getting them certified in various areas in construction so that when they leave, they're able to um, have some sort of certification. She was among the guests on Education in Primetime on Wednesday evening and provided further details on the plans being crafted. We are actually in the process of putting the standards together so that we can finalize that so that they can begin that program. So we're looking at all of the areas that they're working on within the prison. Um, even they have baking, because they do everything. The prison is self-sufficient. So we're looking at all of the skilled areas that they have there that can be certified so that we can do that with them and incorporate maybe a numeracy and literacy program along with that. A packed news night indeed, uh, Charmaine, and of course much more to come at 10 o'clock when we'll have updates on other stories that we're closely tracking as well. All right, stick around. When we come back from this break, we'll turn our attention to news overseas. You don't want to miss this.